Greetings ladies and mandalgens, and welcome to this latest episode of Tales, Tales from, from Outer from Space. Outer space. Taken from the subreddit HFY. The links to all the stories will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider subscribing. Story number one. What do you mean it goes boom? Written by Zavila. Captain Thraxus perused the ship's manifest one more time. There was a late entry to join the convoy to Sucria. Sicria was a remote world and had been having pirate problems and a mechanic traffic attacked several times over the past two years. As the pirates had got more bold, the situation had become unattainable and the Galactic Federation had to finally do something about it. Thraxus was the captain of a light cruiser GNF Dural and he had been tasked to escort the merchant convoy from Dilola to Sicria, the deterrence to the pirates. He did not relish the assignment to babysit motley fleet of civilians, but as gal fed captain, he went where he was ordered to. The final ship to join the convoy was the IMS Antelope, a human merchant that had been berthing with the Dilola even before Thraxus had arrived. Apparently, they had some difficulty in securing new cargo to take on board, and look at ship specs, Thraxus could not blame anyone for not wanting to put their valuables on board of an old rust bucket. But Sicria was not exactly a prime destination, and apparently someone had been desperate enough to contract the antelope to ferry their cargo to Sicria in the last minute. The IMS Lantelope was an independent merchant ship, owned and operated by Captain Robert Nelly. Even her designation was roughly human. The humans had some of the most stringent licensing requirements to own and operate a Starship class drives, which basically put them out of reach for civilian individuals. So in turn, the independent merchants had banded together and founded the Independent Merchant Ship Company, which held the license for the Starship drives operated by their members with minimal interference from the company itself. Thraxus scoffed, but the humans were an upstart species. Perhaps it was for the best that not just anyone could get their hands on a potentially volatile technology. That showed more responsibility for them than Thraxus had heard of based on their reputation. The antelope itself was almost 60 years old, and looking at her logs, she had been operating in or around human space. This was as far as she had ever been from home. So, for all that tarnish on her hull, she had passed the latest spaceworthy inspection only six months prior. She was one of the weirdest looking ships Thraxus had ever seen. She was basically a lattice spine on which standard cargo containers were mounted like grapes on a vine. From end to the habitation and docking, the back end had a large engine, ending in a flat plate mounted on what looked like pillars. Curious. Thraxus studied her engine specifications. Her main engine was a type Thraxus had never heard of before. Something her humans called an Orion-type nuclear pulse thruster, and that was her mass, impulse, and thrust she would be by far the slowest ship in the convoy. Only barely scraping over the acceptable lower limit. No jump engine, likewise, was an antiquated Type 1, only barely able to do jumps required for this route. But she was over the bar, so Thraxus got to grudgingly accept her in the convoy. Slightly annoyed, Thraxus sent an engine specifications to his astrature to have their course and time estimates recomputed to match the antelope's slow speed. Then he fired off a message to tell all ten ships that his convoy would prepare to unberth and meet in the system's jump point in twelve hours. After the start of the morning shift, Thraxus entered the bridge to relieve the night shift operators. It would be two hours until the scheduled jump-off time, plenty of time to undock and make their way the 50,000 kilometers to the jump point. Captain Thraxus turned to the operations officer and the previous watch. Anything interesting going on? Lieutenant Commander Tarkran shrugged. Just a human, sir. The antelope cast off six hours ago and has been slowly making the way to the jump point using maneuvering thrusters only. Thraxus was taken back. Huh? Why? Thrakaran shrugged again. No idea, sir, but they'll be arriving at the jump point before the scheduled time. Captain Thraxus shook his head. All right, thanks. I have the bridge. Tarkran nodded and announced, Captain has the bridge and Tarkran turned and left as Thraxus sat down on the command chair. 
Captain Thrax has waited for other stations to complete their watch handover and then turned to the communications. Lieutenant Cackles, request undocking. Aye, sir, the comm officer said. Thraxus then turned to Astrid officer. Lieutenant Ulan, please prepare the course plan to take the ship to jump point after we've moved past the station's safety perimeter and execute once we have undocking permission. Next, Thraxus glanced over at his executive officer sitting on the opposite station. While we're en route, prepare the convoy placement assignment for each ship according to the exclusion zones of their engines. I want us to be in the middle. Hopefully, the pirates will think we're just another patch of merchantmen until it's too late. Commander Nivix nodded. Hi, sir. I think I can nestle us between the GMS Elliot and the ISS Nahal. Y'all have to see what we can do about the human ship. Very good. Lieutenant Cockles returned. Sir, undocking clearance granted. We have one minute window. Captain Thraxus nodded. Lieutenant Ulan, undock and execute. Hi, sir. There was an almost imperceptible shift as the GFN Jural unlatched from the station and then pushed itself away from the station's bulk using its maneuvering thrusters. After 30 seconds, they had cleared the station's perimeter and they were able to engage the fusion drive. Even at a minimal power as was allowed by use near the station. It would only take them about 30 minutes to reach their designated staging point. Um, Captain? Commander Nevik interrupted after a few minutes. Have you looked at the exclusion chart for the human ship? Thraxus frowned with a brow. No. Why? Commander Nevik hesitated for a moment. I think you should. Captain Thraxus called up the schematic of the human ship on his terminal. It was still one of the ugliest ships he'd ever seen, but he wasn't here to judge beauty contest. He switched the overlay layers to the engine exclusion zone. What the frick? he exclaimed. For most ships, the exclusion zone was a cone behind them, a few degrees wide. For the IMS Antelope, it was a whole half a sphere and then some, covering just under 200 degrees of arc and extending all the way to 5,000 kilometers. With an advisory zone of all the way up to 20,000 kilometers. I think I know why they're limping out there with the maneuvering thrusters only, Commander Nivik posited. There is no way they could have fired up that drive anywhere near the station. After a moment, he continued, I think the only place we can put them is the last ship in the convoy with nobody behind them. Captain Thraxus shook his head in disbelief. Do they have a completely unshielded reactor back there or something? I don't know. I've never seen anything like this, but it must be of design and improved since they've passed their inspections. Thrax aside, we'll transmit the assigned relative positions to all ships and maneuver us into position to wait for them. The convoy of the ten merchant ships had taken up the positions around the cruiser GFN Dural with the IXS Icor in front of him and the IMS Antelope at the rear. All ships slaved their jump engines to the control of the GFN Dural, and in concert they tore a hole in reality that whisked them to another star system a dozen light years away. The system the convoy appeared in was an uninhabited, a puny red dwarf star with only a catalogue number and its name. They would then have to traverse the system to the next jump point that would allow them to jump to the next star in the chain to Sicria. The most of the time traversing in the galaxy was spent moving from jump point to jump point within each star system. Some systems were lucky and the jump points were close by. Others had them far apart and it took us a long time to get a lot of Delta V to traverse. The locations of the jump drive and where you could jump from were dependent on the background arrangement of the dark matter permeating the galaxy which warped the extra dimension of space time. The convoy would have almost a week ahead of them to traverse to the next jump point in this system, and just over two months to reach Sycria. Captain Tharox looked at the monitors and concluded that everything was in order. Lieutenant Ulan plotted a course to the next jump point. The astrodrome glanced over. A ready lady and captain, ready to execute on your command. Very good, Lieutenant, Thraxus acknowledged with pleasure. Signal the convoy to get underway and execute. Ten ships in the convoy each fired up their fusion torches of various sorts, and the convoy started moving. But then behind them, the eleventh ship, the IMS Antelope, something exploded with a fury. Captain, the sensor officer Baride shouted, the engine of the Antelope just exploded. What? The captain looked up. 
just teased luck that the human rust bucket would have a catastrophic engine failure immediately upon firing up the lethal engine of theirs. Signal all stop. As soon as the fleet had started moving, the torches died down as each ship ceased accelerating. Thraxus hit a transmit button on his terminal. This is Captain Thraxus of the Geovangiro to the IMS Antelope. Do you require assistance? Thraxus looked at the sensor scan on his screen and as he waited for a reply. At least, there didn't seem to be much to re. Hopefully, the humans didn't have much casualties. A calm, if slightly confused voice came over the speakers. This is the IMS Antelope. Um... Negative on assistance? Why? What's the problem? Captain Thraxus looked at his sensor officer, who just spread his arms out, and then back at the sensor display, until he finally hit transmit again. Dural to Antelope, did you just not have a catastrophic engine failure? Um, oh! There was a sudden realization in the voice in the audio. Negative, Dural, that was the detonation of a 50 kiloton nuclear propulsion charge. 50 kiloton propulsion. Your ship... Craps out nuclear bombs. Captain Thraxus immediately regretted his lapse into decorum, but the sheer insanity of the idea had caught him completely off guard. Affirmative, Jiral. Apologies for the confusion. The shaped nuclear charges are used to push against the drive plate and back the ship, which transfers the momentum imparted to the ship through a stage shock absorber assembly. After the convoy had gotten over the shock of the human's propulsion system, the rest of the voyage to the jump point passed quickly or as quietly as a fleet training a steam of nuclear explosions can go, just as they had the second and third jumps. When the convoy appeared at the fourth system, en route, another nondescript nameless system, things rapidly went south. Before the convoy had a chance to start moving, a warhead detonated half a million kilometers away from the jump point. Three pirate cruisers brought up their EM suites and aimed their targeting radars at the merchant convoy. The pirates were all poised and about to catch any merchants who chose to try and flee, with each pirate able to cover the large part as possible trajectories. An ultimatum was transmitted on all universal emergency channels. This is Captain Quackats of the Blood Raiders. Stand down your ships and prepare to be boarded. Any resistance will be met with lethal force. Captain Thraxis considered his options. The Federation Fleet Command had not anticipated a heavy pirate resistance. The previous raids had been performed by a single ship. His light cruiser might be able to take on two of the pirates, depending on how well they were equipped and trained, but all three would be a bit much, especially when they were spread out like this. So, he would not be able to concentrate on his point of fence in any single particular direction. On the other hand, he had not yet betrayed the GFN Jiro was a warship, a ship that he had chosen for it because it was roughly the correct size to pass as a median merchantman. Could he use this to his advantage somehow? Lieutenant Cockles, signal all the convoy to stand by. Come, laser only. Let's not tip our hands yet. Captain Thraxus prayed that none of the merchants would panic and start running. He was only one ship, and he couldn't be in two places so at once to protect everyone. Lieutenant Commander Berry used passive scanners only, limit active to equipment and merchantmen could realistically have. Go loud on sensors only if our cover is blown. Thraxus was stalling for time and he knew it. He needed something to give him an edge somehow. Something. Anything. Just one way to neutralize one of the pirate cruisers and even the odds. On the second vectors appeared to showing the pirate ship starting to accelerate carefully towards the convoy since the convoy seemed to be capitulating. Whatever he comes up with would have to come up quickly. Then the comm officer piped up. Captain, we have a laser message from the IMS Antelope. Captain Nelly wants to talk to you. Thraxus sighed. Great, we don't have the time to babysit a panicking merchant right now. Signal them just to stand by. A few moments later, Lieutenant Cockles replied. He's being very insistent, sir. Fine, Thraxus grumbled. Put him on my monitor. Captain Thraxon waited until his screen appeared an image of a middle-aged human wearing a black collared suit and a white shirt underneath, and a tie around his neck. On his head was a white hat with a black visor. On that was a golden patch of the stylized antelope rimmed with golden stark ropes. Captain Nella, what do you want? Thraxus tried to hide his annoyance in his voice, but it was still leaked through. We're kind of busy right now. Captain Nella ignored the tone. Captain Thraxus, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have a suggestion. Am I correct to assume that three pirate ships are too many for you to handle? 
Thraxus hesitated. Then he sighed, Captain, this is no time for ego. Is it so? He looked at Thraxus with stern eyes. Because, if it is, the antelope can take one of them. Thraxus's eyes widened. What? No, out of the question. Captain, the antelope's drive plate is designed to withstand repeated nuclear explosions with minimal ablation. It is tougher than a battleship hull. And I bet the pirates don't know that our ship craps out nuclear bombs, either, as you so eloquently put it. Lella glared at Thraxus. I'm not planning to die today, after the failed last stand, so one more time. Do you need help or not? Thraxus glanced at the side as much as he didn't want to admit it. He did need help. After an agonizing moment, he turned back to see a face of the other captain. Yes, you're right. We can probably take two of them, but not all three at the same time. Nella nodded. All right, so here is what I have in mind. The control room of the merchant van was a Spartan compared to the bridge of a warship. Captain Robert Nelly was standing next to the sensor comm station looking at the radar plot. His heart raced as he hoped he wasn't about to do something completely stupid. He glanced around as he knew the rest of the crew felt the same, but they had to release dry. He breathed a deep sigh once and then exhaled. All right, Terry, jettison the cargo containers. Akadi, use the Azipod thrusters and let's make it like a bat at a howl. The engineer, Terry Groove, hit the buttons on a console and a series of thumbs echoed out through the ship. All containers released. Helm officer Arkady Stakowik used the translation joystick to pull the ship backwards and from between the containers that were now lazily floating in space. We're free. Then she turned the ship to the new heading and fired the Azapod maneuvering thrusters at full, batting out of hell. The Azapod's thrusters could be turned to allow the ship to accelerate in almost any direction. They were meant to be used for near ports for both maneuvering and mobility where the Antelope couldn't use her main nuclear pulse engine. Because of this, the Azapods were unusually powerful for a ship of size, and with the Antelope shed all of her cargo, they would give a pretty decent acceleration. Niels Becker glanced up at the captain standing next to him. Radio from Dural, he pressed the button and put it on the loudspeaker. Captain Thraxus's voice sounded frantic as he yelled at the antelope, Get back here, antelope! Didn't you hear what they said? Robert shook himself to get into character, then pressed the button on Neil's station and shouted back in panic, Frick this crap! I'm getting the hell out of here! It's every man for themselves! He took a second to steady himself again. All right, Niels, let's get on which pirate takes the bait. Akaidi, once we know who's chasing us, turn us over so our drive plate is pointed at them. Make a good show trying to get away. We need to lure them out far enough. Well there, Bob, Arcady acknowledged. I'll give them a merry chase. Now, we just hope that they don't just disable us and don't use missiles. Robert moist everyone's concerned. Terry, how are your modifications coming along? Without even looking up from her console, Terry replied, I've got the launcher pad, I've voided pretty much every warranty we have, but I've managed to coax the load four charges at once. With our biggest bombs, that'll give them a two megaton surprise. Robert nodded. Very good. Terry continued, the bombs turned out to be trickier. I should be able to get their attitude control software overridden, but they also have the hardware safeties. I had to send Jonesy to physically bypass them, but that also means that he can slap a radio module on them while he's at it, so we'll be able to detonate on these command. Robert grinned. Excellent, great work. Let me know when Jonesy is done with the mods. Aye, one last thing. Once we load up the bombs into the launcher, we won't be able to unload them anymore. All right, keep the launcher on full manual then, and load only on my command for now. Peels interjected. Contact 3 is altering course to intercept. I've colored her pink on the radar plot. Robert glanced over at the helm. Arcady, on it. And now new course, they'll reach the weapon range in 52 minutes. By that time, we'll have spent 84% of our maneuvering propellant. Terry winced. Robert noticed it. What's wrong, Terry? Oh, I'm thinking of our next overhaul. The Azapods weren't meant to be used this hard for this long. Good to see that you're still an optimist. Arcady said, as Terry glowered at him. He added, You think we're gonna live long enough that it matters? Terry laughed, and the rest of the command crew chuckled. Their moment of mirth was, however, cut short when Niels announced a message from Contact 3. 
Antelope, this is Captain Mr. Iyer of the Raider bathed in blood. Stand down immediately or you'll be fired upon. This is your only warning. After a moment of silence, Captain Nedda said, Let them eat static. It had been a tense half an hour as the Antelope had led the pirate raider away from the rest of the group. Once they were too far away for the base of the blood to turn back and help his pirate brethren, the GFN Jural had broken off the convoy and raced to meet the other two pirates. With all pieces in motion, there was now Captain Mr. Iyer's turn to make the choice. He had three choices, continue pressing the antelope, turn back and attack the GFN Jural, or turn and run away. If he turned to attack the Jural, he would arrive at the battle too late to help Red Mayhem and Dead Rising. If the two ships could not beat the Jural, then he would face the Jural on his own, and it might not go any way depending on how much damage Mayhem and Dread had inflicted on her. If, on the other hand, Mayhem and Dread managed to destroy Jural, then he had just let the antelope escape for no reason. If he decided to run, then the chances, depending on whatever Mayhem and Dread could destroy or disable Jural, Jural was faster than she could be able to catch up with the bathed in blood before he could slip out of the system at the next point. But if Mayhem and Dread did manage to destroy Jural, his attempt to flee would not have looked upon kindly by the leaders of the raiders. So, no matter what happens, his only real option was to press on the antelope. If Mayhem and Dread won against the GFM Journal, then capturing the antelope was a most useful thing he could do. If Mayhem and Dread lost to the GFN Jural, then he was no longer better or worse positioned than if he had turned away from the antelope. He would still have to face the Jural just the same. He sent a message to Captain Quartox aboard the Red Mayhem with his plan of action to continue chasing the antelope and to make sure that she couldn't escape, and the rationale for taking its action. What he didn't mention was that if the Mayhem and Dread lost to the Jural but damaged her enough for him to destroy her, well, then he would have just become the new leader of the Blood Raiders. The atmosphere was tense in the control room of the IMS Antelope. Minutes ticked by as the raider bathed in blood chased them. Several hundred thousand kilometers away from the GFN Jural and the raiders Red Mayhem and Dead Rising were fast approaching each other. Nuclear explosion, Niels announced suddenly. The raiders have started firing on GFM Jural. I think Jural's point defense got the warhead. It was too far away to cause any damage. Robert nodded at once. They could do nothing more to help. The battle was now up to Captain Thraxos. Two more. This time against Contact 2, their point defense stopped them. Thraxos and Jural had an advantage. They could fire their magazines empty if they had to do so without consequences. For the pirates, every missile they shot was an invaluable, for they couldn't just pull it into the naval yard and resupply. But there were still two pirate ships, and if their magazines were full, then Jural would be in serious trouble. No fire for a few moments, I think that they were just probing each other with extreme missile range. Robert turned to Niels. How long until Bath and Blood is in missile range, assuming their range is similar? Niels looked up the range plot. Two minutes. Suddenly, there was a radiation alarm. Robert looked at Niels and then looked at the Are you sure? all over his face. Niels looked at his instruments. That was 10,000 kilometers away and off to the side. I think it was a warning shot. Negligible radiation dose. Robert thought for a moment and weighed his options. We'll keep going. Hopefully they won't waste another missile on us. Uneasy silence returned as more minutes ticked by. Only occasionally broken as Niels reported the events of the battle happening far away. The exchange of fire increased and the combatants got closer. GFM Dural was pressing contact to and the dread rising and closing the distance as fast as she could. Her point defenses were working at near saturation as the two pirates poured missile after missile upon her. But likewise, her missiles pushed her pirate crew aboard the dead rising to the limit as well. Hit! Niels exclaimed. Contact 2 has left behind debris. Everyone cheered. A hit was nice, but it wasn't the end of the battle. Nowhere near. More ships were compartmentalized to maximize and even direct warheads hit and cripple them only. Soon the flashes of missile warheads were joined with the invisible beams of anti-ship lasers as GFM Jural and Dead Rising reached energy weapon range. Both ships took hits in the hull. More ship armor had diamond threads woven into it, which was as close as you could get to a go-thermal superconductivity. 
Each time a laser flashed across the panel, the Wii would try and spread it out thermal load to try and keep the plating from vaporizing locally where it was hit and hopefully the plate would be able to radiate the heat off away before another hit. But if any plate was saturated by heat, the entire plate would melt all at once. Niels was able to see the thermal spikes in the IR scopes, but his instruments weren't powerful enough to resolve what effects those kits had. Neither were the instruments on the other merchants who were relaying their scanner data to the antelope as well, which had let Neil see the bathed in blood even though it was on the shadow of the drive plate. Otherwise, the plate would have been a blind spot for them, for no sensor could be mounted on it and that would be able to withstand the constant bombardment of nuclear fire it was under in normal operation. They could only guess at how the battle was going, both ships were streaming air and metal behind them, both ships were hurt, but how bad it was anyone's guess. Then their own trouble started. Terry frowned. I think we've just been shot by the bathed in blood with lasers. I'm reading an increased thermal load from the drive plate, activating cooling system. Robert swallowed. This was it for them. Here goes nothing then. Arcady, start jinking the azipods, make it look like the drive plate remains between us. Let's make it look good and not give them an easy target. I think we just had a near miss and the dry plate heat spiked again, but much less. I think only the halo of the laser caught us this time. Robert nodded. Keep going. With their overpower azipods being able to move them laterally in almost any direction with the cargoless antelope was exceedingly difficult to target for the bathed in blood to hit compared to a warship. Every jink burned a little more of the maneuvering propellant. They wouldn't be able to keep this up much too much longer. Direct hit on our plate, Terry announced to them once more. Vent all our airlocks. Let's make them think that they hurt us. The antelope shuddered and a little the airlocks blew out a cloud of air around the ship. Too bad we didn't think of loading some junk in them beforehand, Niels commented. Robert grinned. Yeah, but this'll have to do. Terry load up the 10 kiloton starter charge into the launcher. Next time they score a direct hit, fire it. Arcady, when that goes boom, put us into a spin. Hopefully they'll think they got our engines and disabled us. Got it, Arcady acknowledged. Terry hit some of the buttons on a console. Charge loaded. Arcady, when I say stop, stop thrusting. I don't want us to drift out of the drive plate's shadow before the charge goes off. Arcady nodded. The bathed in blood scored a few more near misses, but then the heat of the plate spiked again. A direct hit. Stop, Terry shouted, and then hit the button manually to fire the drive once. A few moments later, there was a brilliant flash of visible light in the bathed of blood, and the antelope felt a surge of acceleration as the shock absorbers pushed their ship with the momentum of the nuclear explosion in front of them. Arcady immediately used the azipods to give the ship a bit of a good spin making it turn end over end. This was the moment when Robert bet them all in. If the pirate cruiser would fire their laser even one more time, they could hold them straight through, for the merchantmen had no armor plating cladding anywhere on the ship. The bridge was deathly silent as everyone was holding their breaths. Seconds passed, then seconds more passed. The recharge time of the pirate's spinal laser came and went, and there was no earth-shattering kaboom. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief, and seconds turned into minutes. The pirates wanted a prize, and they thought they had it. Even as the battle lulled here, in the distance, the battle between the Dural and the pirates raged on. Captain Thraxus had managed to break the dead rising into a laser exchange. The pirate cruiser was a wreck, hauled straight through in multiple places, with a large hole where her main power plant used to be. But Dural had suffered greatly as well. On one side, her hull had been scarred clean of her point defenses. A number of missile launchers were disabled or destroyed, and several compartments were open to space as well. She was streaming air as she turned towards the remaining pirate. All the while, they continued exchanging as much missiles fire as they could. But the crew of the Antelope had no time to spectate for long. With them disabled and the dead in space, the raider bathed in blood had been able to close the remaining distance much faster than they were getting ready to pull up alongside them. Captain Nelly stood at the console station when watched the plot with the officer Packer. He and Niels kept glancing at each other nervously as the distance closed, getting the final part of the plan correct was critical, for they would only get one chance. 
Once their elements of surprise were lost, they would be sitting ducks in the missile of a pirate raider. Terry, load up the launcher with the biggest charges we have. Arcady, once the bathe in blood is within 10 kilometers, stabilize us and aim the drive blade at him. Terry, once we're stabilized, go to rapid fire on the launcher with as many of the 500 kiloton charges as you can. Robert breathed and calmed himself. Detonate the charges when you think it's optimal. Or if it seems they've spotted our ruse, let's hope this works. Terry nodded and worked frantically on her consoles to execute the instructions. She would have to program the bombs to rotate to face the bathed in blood instead of their own drive plate. She'd replace the normal inertial stabilizing software with her own and uploaded it to the bombs. But still, she had to compute the differences based on her guesswork and where the bathed in blood would be in relation to them when the bombs would be triggered. The bombs couldn't do it themselves, since they had no external sensors, only gyros so they knew how their own orientation and nothing else. Twenty kilometers, Niels announced. Time seemed to crawl as every person ran on adrenaline. Fifteen kilometers, Arcady held the stick, ready to execute. He had already turned the azapods ready to cancel their rotation, but then he would have to turn to face the pirate cruiser. Twelve kilometers... 11 kilometers, 10 kilometers. Arcady waited for a moment more before she pulled down the stick to make sure that they were stop as close to the target attitude as possible. The ship heaved as the azapods worked to halt its turn. With the spin nulled, Arcady then rolled the ship and the azapods wouldn't have to slew a new direction before he could point the ship towards the pirate. He wanted to shave every second he could. On target, Arcady announced. Terry hit the button to execute the program, launching. The whole operation took only seconds and the pirates were caught completely off guard. The pirate ship took no action as the four little elongated spheres flew out towards the little holes in the middle of the antelope's massive dry plate. A few seconds later, another group of spheres flew out and another. The pirate ship finally stopped their approach with the maneuvering thrusters and started to turn their spinal lasers to point at the not as disabled as they thought merchantmen to finish them off. Terry waited until the last moment possible before the first group of nukes would drift past the pirate ship and put the pirate out of the cone of their ship charge. Then she pressed the button. Firing! A dozen 500 kiloton nukes exploded in unison at point-blank range on the pirate cruiser. Six megatons in total of nuclear fury. But these weren't just nukes. They were shaped charges that most of the blast directed forward through the heavy laser of tungsten that was turned into vapor and shot at plasma towards a hapless pirate whose hull did not have heavy reinforcements the antelope's own dry plate did. At point-blank range, this barrage could have hulled a battleship. Then, a few seconds later, another two megaton barrage exploded. Then another... Bathed in blood, finally finished turning to bring their spinal lasers to the merchantmen, but it did not stop. It continued to turn, laser while remaining dark. A cloud of air and debris surrounded the hulk of the pirate ship. Then the fourth barrage of bombs hit their main power plant, and the bathed in blood split into two as the reactors amidship exploded. Sounds of debris rang out all along the antelope as the explosion pushed against the drive plate, pushing the ship harmlessly away from the destroyed hulk of the pirate cruiser. Holy freaking crap, Niels mouthed as he looked at the sensor screen. Captain Robert Nelly walked over to his chair and collapsed into it as the tension and the adrenaline in his system disappeared. Everyone on the bridge deflated as they had been balloons from which their air had been slit out. Reload the drive with the propulsion charges and get us the frick out of here. Robert breathed heavy with relief. Terry fired the last modified charges to clear the launcher. Her hand shook as she hovered over the firing button. She couldn't bring herself to press it. Not anymore. The pirate ship was already more than destroyed, and she let the nuke stripped away past the wreckage as she adjusted the loading priority for the launcher and the rest to standard automatic operations. In a few seconds, the first 10 kiloton charge aimed at their own plate fired and pushed them away. Terry let the computer take over, and soon the antelope picked up a speed at great rate, galloping away from the broken and hulled wreck of the pirate ship like a namesake. Empty of cargo, even the lightest charges accelerated her like she was an Olympic sprinter. The direction didn't matter, as long as it was away. 
They had already forgotten the battle that had been going on elsewhere. Ten minutes later, the numb silence of the control room was broken by a radio call. GFN Gerald to IMS Antelope, Captain Nella, what is your status? IMS Antelope joined back with the convoy. The GFN Jewel pulled out alongside her, or what was left of the GFN Jewel. The battleship had the pirates had taken a tremendous toll on the light cruiser. There was nary a square meter of a hull that wasn't scarred by battle damage. There was a large gash along one side and even a hole clear through. The other side was scoured clean with the hull mounted weapons and sensors, and several compartments were open to space. Over a third of a crew were dead. There was a small miracle that she was still flying at all. But the pirate fleet had paid an even more dearly. All three cruisers floated dead in space as wasted hulled wrecks. Bathed in blood, lay in twain with the spine broken. Dead Rising was missing an entire quarter of the ship where the power plant used to be. And Red Mayhem lay shattered in pieces after multiple missiles hit when Jural had finally managed to overwhelm her point defenses. There were very few survivors from the pirate fleet, and even fewer who had wanted to be survivor. Only 15 life pods had been launched from the Hawks out into the total crew of 120. The rest had perished in battle or chosen to perish in the Hawks. The survivors' pods would be picked up in due time to face the justice for their actions. Captain Thraxus watched the human ship on his screen and saluted. The antelope may have been an old and tarnished. She may have looked odd and ugly. But right now, Captain Thraxus was proud to have her and her crew in his fleet. She was no longer part of the convoy. She was one of its protectors, and it was thanks to her that they triumphed today against insurmountable odds. End of story. And that, my friends, is the end of the video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author, check the links down below for the original link. But if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways listed down below. But the easiest would be to share this with as many people as possible to help the channel grow. And I will see you all in the next video. And until then, I hope you all have a good one. Cheers.